Um, when we started discussing the women that we were going to cover for the, this series, um, one of the classes that I was taking uh, was on Ruth and Jonah. And so I had time to um, read and study about Ruth. And when Andrew told me that I was preaching today, this was probably a month or two ago, um, I looked at the lectionary, and it just so happened that the lectionary had um, a reading from Ruth. And so if you don't know what the lectionary is, um, churches within our de denomination and other denominations uh, use what's called the Revised Common Lectionary. And this really just lays out week by week uh, scripture readings for the ver various seasons of the church. And so it just so happened that Ruth fell on today. Uh, so, uh, so when I first started looking at it, I had an idea as to where I wanted to go. Um, it's a text that's really full of love and loyalty, but there's some sex and seduction. Um, so it's, you know, it's got, it's got some highs and lows, and it's, you know, a story of redemption, and it's a, just really a very interesting story and a well-crafted story. Um, it's a story of women, though, who use their sexuality to secure their future, and th because this is really the only option that's available to them. And so, you know, in this community, in this structure that they live in, uh, they don't have the opportunity or the rights that men have. So, you know, as I began reading and studying and writing, even though this was in my mind that I wanted to talk about, you know, this oppression of women, um, I, I went in another direction. And so I want you to know that I didn't set out to write the sermon that I ended up writing. I wanted to talk to you about, um, you know, this patriarchal structure that these women were put in and, and, and the oppression that they suffered and the things they had to do. But instead, I ended up writing about something else. And it may be a sermon that I needed to preach. And so I just indulge me, um, if you will. Um, but it may be some, something that someone else needs to hear too. So I hope that... Um, that it does reach you. Um, as I did last, last time I preached about the women, I um, referenced some of the women that wrote uh, the books or uh, who had helped me along. And so two of the books that, we, that I used this week, um, one is still that same book that we talked about earlier, which is um, Preaching the Women of the Old Testament. And then the other book is just a, just a commentary, but again, written by a woman. And so uh, once again, I just want to point out to you that women are doing some amazing things in the church. And, uh, and as it should be, and, and as it's always been. So let's read from Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Af Aphrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Eli Melech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Melon and Kilion also died, so that the woman was left with her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab, Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the, Lord, may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. 
So she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Let's just pray a moment, please. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the women of the scripture who continue to teach us through their struggles and oppression. Thank you for the story of Naomi and Ruth. And in their story, allow me to find truth for today and strength for the future. Let each of us find truth in their stories and strength in their actions. In Jesus' name we pray. So you're likely familiar with this story, or at the very least, you're familiar with verses 16 through 17, where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God, and so on. Um, These verses are often used at weddings. Um, They're used to emphasize the love and the loyalty of marriage. But the truth of these verses is much darker. As we've read, Naomi has lost her husband and her sons. Famine has struck the place in which they have resided for more than 10 years, and Naomi has become desperate. In her desperation, she decides to return to Bethlehem. But as her journey begins, she directs Ruth and Orpah to return to their families. And verse 14 says, they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And so Orpah returns home, and Ruth stays with Naomi. Now, we join the story at this crisis point, right? Naomi has lost all hope for a secure future. Naomi's lost her husband, her sole means of support. Um, If you noticed as we read the passage, Naomi talks a lot about a husband and children, and, and she's focused on the fact that she's old and she cannot survive, she cannot support herself without a man in her life. Now, as a widow, it would have been common for her sons to take care of her, but she's lost her sons as well. So she's overcome with grief. Uh, Naomi's bereft. She's lonely. She's abandoned. And Ruth, Ruth is also suffering, right? Ruth is suffering grief. She, too, is likely feeling uncertain about her future. And yet, she clings to Naomi. She doesn't abandon Naomi. Instead, she pledges to follow her to stay with her no matter what. But Naomi's pain is intense, right? It's immense pain. And it's out of this pain that Naomi declares that even the hand of the Lord is against her. Now, this idea that somehow God is responsible for Naomi's grief, that God is responsible for all of the death in her family, it's it's just a a common human reaction, right? Right? It's likely a a reaction that we can all relate to on some level. I know um, when my daughter passed away last year, there were well-meaning people who would say things like, God needed an angel. God needed another voice in the choir. Or God must have needed Allie. We can't really know God's reason for taking her. Those are, are things that bring up that anger against God. Why would God take someone so young, why would God take someone that you love? Well, I know that they meant well. And there was at least one or two occasions where I may have responded in a less than charitable way. I might have told them where they were wrong. And then people would ask me, you know, why aren't you mad at God? And my response was always that God had nothing to do with my daughter's death. Just as God had nothing to do with the death of Naomi's family. For my daughter, it was just cancer. That was the explanation, right? That's what made sense to me. It wasn't God. You see, the God that I know does not strike young women down with metastatic breast cancer at 30 years old. The God that I know doesn't take our loved ones from us. The God I know suffers along with us. The God I know walked this earth 
to suffer with us and that God continues to suffer with us. The horrible things that happen, they happen because we live in a world that God has left to us, that God's left in our control. A world that we've done a poor job of caring for. We live in a world where we waste food while children starve. We live in a world where we have done such a poor job of taking care of the environment that it's killing us. A world where the oppressed are at times forced to act out in violence. And then at the same time, we live in a world where it's our job to present the image of God. To care for those who are sick, to feed those who are hungry. It's our job to care for those who grieve. We live in this world where it's our job to show up and love those in need. So God didn't take Eli Melech from Naomi. God didn't cause her sons to die of hunger. Famine killed Naomi's family. God didn't raise a hand against Naomi. God showed up and suffered along with Naomi. Ruth showed up for Naomi. It was Ruth who presented the image of God to Naomi. Now, you all, you were my Ruth. <laughs> you showed up for me over and over again as I grieved. You loved me, you cared for me, even when I didn't want to do it, even when I didn't want to be loved and cared for. And just as God doesn't take our loved ones, God doesn't abandon us in our grief, God shows up in the love and the care of those who love and care for us. And for this, I'm grateful to God, and, and I am grateful to you, and I thank you for that. But Naomi, she didn't recognize the image of God in Ruth. The pain was too much for her. To her eye, there was little hope for a secure future. And yet Ruth, a young woman, a Moabite, living in Moab, she sets aside her own needs for survival and success to stay with Naomi. Lynn Japinga points out that in a culture where husbands were the key to survival and success, a poor, powerless young woman promised her life to a poor, powerless older woman. Ruth adopted Naomi's people and even her God. So we see Ruth making a considerable sacrifice and deciding to go with Naomi. She's leaving her home of Moab, where as a young woman, it's likely that she could marry again. It's likely that she could have secured some form of success and survival. But Ruth commits to follow Naomi to Judah and into Bethlehem. Sackenfeld writes that for Ruth, the commitment to accept Naomi's people as her own is made in the face of possible, even probable, rejection by that people. As Ruth expresses her intent, readers must imagine that she is aware that the people of Judah are unlikely to accept a Moabite as a member of their community. This reality is, in fact, highlighted further in the story by the repeated references to her as the Moabite. Her ethnic identity stands as a barrier that must be challenged to enable her full inclusion in the new community. Ruth is risking much in committing herself to Naomi's people. You see, the Moabites, they're descendants of Lot's son, Moab. They were not always looked upon favorably by the people of Israel. They were born of incest. So they were, they were considered to be... Uh, Second-class citizens, if you will. So this adds this layer of complication to Ruth's decision to stay with Naomi and return to Bethlehem. And yet, Ruth declares, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. And this, is, this is extraordinary, right? I mean, you think about what is facing Ruth, and yet she shows this love and this loyalty. She's willing to sacrifice uh, for Naomi. We don't even really get a sense that Naomi appreciates this. When Ruth tells her that she'll stay with her, Naomi barely, if not, doesn't acknowledge that fact. But yet Ruth is willing to stay. 
So the Hebrew term for this kind of extraordinary behavior is hesed. It's usually translated as kindness or loyalty, but kindness and loyalty may not be strong enough words to describe hesed. Sackenfeld writes that it refers to care or concern for another with whom one is in relationship, but care that specifically takes shape in action to rescue the other from a situation of desperate need and under circumstances in which the rescuer is uniquely qualified to do what is needed. Ruth fits all of that, right? She's staying with Naomi to help her secure a future. She is qualified to do that because she's younger, more desirable, I suppose, uh, in that society. Japinga calls this steadfast love. Now, it's obvious that we ought to be like Ruth. We ought to be the image and presence of God in the lives of those who grieve and those who suffer. We ought to show this steadfast love. We ought to show hesed. Not love from afar, not thoughts and prayers kind of love, but the love that takes action. The love that aims to make a difference in the life of another. This is who we should be. This is our purpose. It's our purpose to be Ruth. So while we should be like Ruth, we must also recognize that we are Naomi. In our loss or in our grief or in our suffering, we become stubborn. We turn those away who offer their love and care. We go into this self-sufficiency mode, thinking that we're on our own and that we can do this on our own. And some of us get angry at God. We blame God for the death and the suffering in our lives. We get to feeling that the hand of the Lord is against us, that God has abandoned us. But you see, like Naomi, we fail to see that God is still with us. Naomi failed to see that God was still with her. Naomi thought that she had lost everything. She couldn't see what was left. And this is sometimes our problem too, right? In our grief and in our loss, in the pain and suffering, it's difficult to see what's left. It's difficult to find gratitude. We can become so overcome with grief that we lose sight of the other child or the children who remain with us, who are loving us. We lose sight of the love and the compassion of our family and friends. And while none of these people can replace the one who's lost, they can help us heal. And yet Naomi feels that the hand of the Lord is against her, that God has abandoned her. But this is far from the truth. Uh, we read repeatedly in scripture that God is with us, that God loves us, that God will never abandon us. In Isaiah 41, God assures the people of Israel, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, do not fear, I will help you. Or to a people facing opposition and war, Moses assures them, be strong and bold, have no fear or dread of them, because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Paul to the Philippians, the Philippians who provided for him and, and, and helped him in his mission. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. In Matthew, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And Jesus said to his disciples, I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. So you see, this idea of hesed, this steadfast love, this love that takes action, is the love of God. God shows up in our lives to get us through the difficult times. God walks beside us and suffers with us. And God shows up in the love of others. So while you may be inclined to act out your inner Naomi and reject the Ruth in your life, 
embrace her. Accept the love and the care of those who grieve with you and for you. And, and I say those words as much for me as for anyone. Because I know that I don't always do that. Accept the love and the care of those who want you to rise above your suffering and reclaim your joy. Welcome Ruth to your side. Welcome God into your life. And accept the hesed that comes from God. May it be so.